morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third uh, webinar in our uh, Penang, uh, Climate Change in Penang webinar series. Uh, I'm very glad that you join us today. Again, for those who have joined us before, uh, we, we're really happy that you can be with us today. So um, our webinar today is on green economy. So the title is Transition to a Green Economy. Based on what we had discussed before, where in the first webinar we set out the challenges that Penang is going to face, especially when it comes to climate change impact, we have been exploring different issues on what Penang can do to actually uh, deal with the threats that we, we are facing. So today we have three uh, uh, very good panelists. Uh, they also dear friends. Uh, we have uh, Miss Amaji Kao. She's a senior consultant of CMC at St. Pierre Perhat. She has been consulting with businesses regarding sustainable development for many years. And our second panelist is uh, Ms. Catherine Chua. Catherine is the vice president of the Association of Tourist, Tourism Attractions in Penang. Uh, she is also the managing director of uh, Tropical Spice Company. And lastly, but not, uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ahmed Zabri. He is the acting Pungara, acting director of the Urban Services Department of um, Sabrang Parai City Council. So thank you all for joining us today. I will start by uh, going through some very uh, some slides very quickly, just to set the background, the context of what green economy is, uh, what green economy means in Penang. Then uh, we will move on to Amarjit, Catherine, and Mrs. Zabri. And as we before, our Q and A session will open at, at the end of the last uh, panelist presentation. So okay, if you can bear with me, I will uh, now share my screen. Okay. Okay, so in 2018, uh, uh, our project Penang Green Agenda 2030, we set up a group, a working group looking into green economy, the issue of green economy for Penang. So these are the things that we have uh, discussed about and also some of the findings of the working group. So generally, what is green economy? There are many, many def definitions out there, uh, but we are using this one particularly from, from UNEP. It's, it means that an economy that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcity. It is low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive. And we have decided, the working group has decided that in terms of when it comes to green economy, we want to focus more on the desired outcomes than the, 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 the one line definition itself. So the desired outcomes of green economy that we want to see or we want to have in Penang comprise of outcomes you want to see in the field of economy, social and environment. And in terms of economy, for example, we would like you know, to, to have a circular economy. We want to have strong innovation base. We want to have a resilient economy with diversification of uh, sectors. We want open market we, and we want the smart incorporation of industry 4.0. So using digital technology to help industries, our health economy to grow in a sustainable way. When it comes to social uh, elements of green economy, we want obviously, you know, uh, to reduce income inequality. More importantly, we want to increase social mobility through uh, knowledge, uh, uh, flexible knowledge-based workforce. And we also want open and resilient society. And last but not least, we, in terms of the environment, we want to have an environment that is highly resource efficient, so which is part of the tenets of a circular economy and we want low pollution, we want a near zero waste and carbon emission, we want preservation of our natural assets and we also want a resilient environment meaning that we need to make our uh, natural assets and um, our food resources, water resources to be able to, uh, uh, to face the challenges that we're going to have in the future. Uh, sorry, hold on. Okay. So reasons for transition to a green economy. Why, why should we do it in Penang? Uh, Penang very, is very much connected to the global supply chain. We have a huge industry base here. And if we want to tap into or, or continue to be relevant in the global supply chain, where it is heading towards a greener supply chain, we need to start looking into green supply chain. So we need to start to 
upgrade our industries to make sure that they meet the standards of, uh, of uh, products or processing set by other countries where we want to import, uh, export to. And it also creates new jobs and income opportunities, which is very relevant mm -hmm. in this post-COVID uh, uh, economic situation. It's, it's also about creating new skills. And very importantly, Penang has no serious legacy issue, meaning that we, it's not like we currently have a lot of heavy industries. It would be very difficult for us to move. We currently don't have a lot of baggages. So if, if we want to, we can move quite quickly. And then you, overall, it will increase livability and create the long-term sustainability of, of the planet. And the main sectors for green economy that we have discussed in the working group are uh, 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 EE and manufacturing industry. So it's about sourcing, it's about uh, cleaning up and upgrading the whole sort of production line, product innovation, recycling. We also have tourism. Tourism is a big part of our GDP. So we should think about how do we create a value added for our tourism sector in the post-COVID uh, uh, era? How do we create a unique selling point by making it very sustainable, by making a, a place where people want to visit because they want to experience uh, sustainable tourism? And we also talk about buildings, waste, energy, transport, water. So these are the main sectors where we can take action on when it comes to green economy. And what's next? So this is the last slide. So hopefully it will set the context for, for our, uh, the subsequent presentations of three panels later. So what's next? So it's about creating baselines. We need to know where we are going. We need to know how quickly and how much we can go. We need to know where we are at the moment. So we need to create baselines for all these sectors. We need to create visions, you know, ambitions and targets. We need to think about what sort of policies and programs that are suitable for each sector. We need to think about using innovative instruments and mechanisms, green financing, for example, green bonds. Uh, we need to yeah, identify alternative financing sources, create clear KPIs, capacity building programs, and lastly, carry out review and verification to make sure that we are indeed heading towards the, the right direction. Just to uh, mention that is, green yeah. economy is also uh, a part, uh, you can also find the, the term green economy, uh, the aspiration of green economy in Penang 2030 vision, which is a, a, a vision of our current uh, uh, chief minister who has been really trying to make Penang to be a family friendly, smart and green uh, state by 2030. So that's it for my presentation very quickly. Uh, let's hope that this has given you some sort of indication of what, what we are yeah, talking yeah, about when it comes yeah, to yeah, green yeah. economy. And uh, oh. uh, yeah, sorry, before I pro proceed, can I ask if any of you still has your mic on because we are hearing some conversation, I think, at the background. So if, if you're not a presenter, if you're can you please mute your mic so, mic so that uh, our, our webinar session can go on smoothly? Thank you so much. So I'll now pass the floor to Ms. Amarjit Kaur. Uh, she will be enlightening us with her insights uh, accumulated over years and years of experience working with industries on how actually industries incorporate sustainability and what effect it has on our industry, whether it is good for businesses and how it's good for businesses and also the environment. Okay, Amarjit, the floor is yours. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Shinwei, for that. Uh, let me first start with sharing my screen. Okay, um, thank you firstly for inviting me to uh, share some thoughts about sustainability and business. Uh, like Shinwe mentioned, um, I've been doing this kind of work for the last 20 years. Uh, I've been working with industry from all kinds of sectors in uh, helping them to determine and address their issues, especially those related to um, sustainability, like environmental health, safety, and um, et cetera. So over the years, uh, I'm actually pleased to say in the last 20 years, I have actually seen uh, a positive progression. Yeah? Things are actually getting better. Uh, when I first started this, um, and a quick fact for you, I'm actually a graduate of USM. So when I first started uh, this work, things were pretty bad, but 
over the past 20 years, we can see that things have progressed on. And I think now people are beginning to be able to spell sustainability, whereas before probably they didn't know anything. Yeah. So I'm going to, sustainability is such a wide subject, but my focus here is with regards to how businesses are responding to this. How does it uh, implicate businesses? And also I will speak in the context of Penang as far as I can. Yeah. Uh, after all, Penang is the pearl of the Orient, but then Yep, my mouse decided to go for a walk. Yeah, okay, there I go. Now, where is the Pearl of the Orient? What happened here, guys? Yeah, I picked up this photo. This was a photo in the Singapore newspaper showing, uh, you know, black uh, discharges from the island. But then there was another. There was another photo that showed. Uh, during COVID, it became green. Wow, and everyone was so pleased. But the thing about this photo, it shows that there is a lot of activities going on along the, uh, the riverbank that is uh, creating these discharges. And these activities mainly, you know, to do with workshops and all that. And a lot of this is basically oil and grease. So there you go, Penang, that's your first headache, yeah? Then we were exposed to all this news yeah, about landslides, etc. Again, this is all just so that you can have a place to live because there's so many people now moving to Penang and why not? It's such a beautiful island, right? But in order to cater to all those people, you need to have uh, roofs over their heads. So what happens is, you know, the developers also take the opportunity and they start building. But, you know, uh, probably things go wrong, yeah, maybe because due to the way they build and also due to other factors such as climate change, right? So we have these kind of disasters. Um, but again, these are things that are happening in supply chains of uh, uh, building homes, right? So there are a lot of parties involved in this and a lot of people responsible. And then we saw in, I think about in 2017, there was a, um, a lot of rain. Penang still gets a lot of rain and there was a lot of floods. And due to the floods, the SME sector in Penang lost 200 million uh, uh, ringgit. Yeah? And this, some, people, some say it's because of climate change. Yeah? So what happens with climate change, you have got um, more frequent uh, rains and the intensity of the rain increases. So this is the consequence. So businesses, they're not immune from all these uh, issues. Another thing that's been coming up now, which is so um, prevalent in Malaysia, not only in Penang, is modern slavery. Now, modern slavery doesn't mean when your boss asks you to do work and then you need to carry, take that work back to home or over the weekend, yeah? Modern slavery is more than that, whereby there is forced labor, yeah? Forced labor means uh, you are engaging uh, employees, but you are not giving them their rights. For example, you take away their passports, uh, you, you bond them, yeah? you call them bonded labor, uh, you don't pay them, yeah? etc. That's forced labor. And back in 2014, yeah, Verite, uh, an NGO, actually came up with a report that said uh, the electrical and electronic sector in Malaysia, in the whole of Malaysia, not just Penang, uh, was quite notorious when it comes to false labor. So reputationally, our reputation was a bit uh, affected by this. And very recently, top glove, you know, COVID brought opportunities as well. People wanted to wear gloves, so top glove production increased. But then um, there were complaints from the uh, workers, yeah, these especially migrant workers, yeah, that they were not uh, looked after. So what had happened was, as you know, the U.S. has kind of like put sanctions on these top glove, uh, produced gloves. And I read in the newspaper yesterday that New Zealand has actually banned any gloves uh, produced by top glove. All because of this, yeah, false labor. So as far as businesses are concerned and even society, yeah, what's going on with regards to sustainability? What are the issues yeah, that are going on? This is the biggest problem, overpopulation. There are just too many people. So when there are too many people, you need to feed them, 
cheaply. You need to house them, you need to clothe them, you need to give them the, the latest gadgets, right? So how do you do that with the resources that we have? Of course, we have got climate change. Climate change will bring problems like food security and we Malaysians love our food, yeah? Uh, we have biodiversity problems. Um, poverty, we have inequality problems, yeah? Uh, we spoke about modern slavery and labor. And of course, urbanization, which is happening a lot in Penang, which brings about things like waste, yeah? Uh, and of course, the latest to join the list is the global pandemic. So over the years, this has been happening. So society will definitely react. And how have they reacted? Um, of course, they go and complain to the government. So the government has to react as well, probably come up with tools, some kind of taxes, come up with polluter pay principles, which are expressed in our legislation. Uh, companies are being held accountable. Yeah, people are protesting against uh, organizations. Maybe not so much here, but you know, in, in uh, other countries. It is affecting customers' branding, right? We have seen what happened with all the sweatshop uh, problems, you know, uh, all the brands like H&M and all that affects their brand, yeah, because of things to do with false labor and all that. So all this is impacting business, which means that businesses, uh, they cannot do business as usual. They have realized that all these issues, although they are happening around them, can impact them. And what is even more interesting now is businesses are beginning to also understand and determine how are they contributing to these issues. Yeah? So it's, they are being impacted, but at the same time, they realize they are contributing to it. But they are also realizing they can solve it. So they are part of the problem, but they are also part of the solution. Okay. So sustainability, yeah, my talk is about sustainability. Um, I never try to define sustainability. People shouldn't try to define sustainability. If you Google sustainability, they have like 130 uh, definitions out there. But think of it as a concept, yeah. It's basically how well our economic, social, institutional, and environmental aspects of our activities uh, 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 interrelate with a non-human environment to continue to the long term, yeah? Or we can think of, of it as how long can we rely on our global systems indefinitely. The two key things I want to highlight here is this is about the long term and this is about reliance on our systems, yeah? So like I said, yeah, a lot of definitions out there, but then think about it as this. Yeah, this is conceptually, it is about the long term and also relying on what we have indefinitely. So if you look at the corporate sector and the organization business level, uh, like I said, they are beginning to understand that they are part of the problem, but they can be part of the solution. So they have realized that they can follow this journey, which will lead them to sustainability. But again, what is sustainability? It's, you know, it's, sometimes it's a bit like religion. I want to do good, but I don't know whether I do good or not. Maybe, you know, in some religions, uh, you know you did good if you go to heaven, you know you didn't do good if you go to hell, yeah? So it's always a journey. So they may start off with uh, things like, you know, giving money because they have a lot of money. They want to give money to feel good about themselves. And then they move on to philanthropy, which is a bit more formalized giving. Then they start doing CSR stuff. CSR stuff is things like, you know, uh, they have to build a mosque, they have to put street lights, yeah? Sometimes these are uh, roles that are supposed to be played by governments, but they are helping out, yeah? And then they hop on to this uh, sustainable development. Remember, sustainable development is about uh, developing without compromising the future generation's uh, ability to uh, move on as well. And hopefully that. Now, sustainability, sustainable development are, are different things uh, because when we want to go towards sustainability, there may be times when you, you do not have development, yeah? where sustainable development is focused on you are developing, but then making sure that the resources are there for the future generation. But there are times where we talk about sustainability, there can't be development, right? So that's why uh, we, we, we separate these two, okay? Other than that, the uh, organizations have also realized there's a lot of pressure on them. Again, because of consumer pressure, societal pressure, uh, things like uh, the ILO, International Labour Organization, is the one that sets all the standards on human rights and, uh, and uh, workers. And then, you know, the UK has come up with a Modern Slavery Act. 
in Malaysia, we have got companies who are listed on Bursa Malaysia. They are, uh, it's mandatory for them to report on their sustainability performance as part of their annual reporting. Mandatory, all right? And then we have other, other of course, initiatives like the Paris Agreement, etc. So, again, another reaction, even at the United Nations level, uh, there have been initiatives for, to help uh, businesses, yeah? to help businesses to understand uh, or provide them guidance and principles on how to address all these things that are going on. So the UNEP fee, we call it the UNEP FI, talks about sustainable financing, UN Global Compact, it's got 10 principles uh, covering social environment, yeah, human rights and all that, that you can sign up to. Uh, these two are about human rights and uh, business. Yeah, They're all guiding principles. So things are moving. There are things out there, tools out there for organizations to uh, use as well. And of course, we've got the SDGs. And remember, the SDGs are actually imposed on governments, but it is so clear that governments alone cannot achieve this, which is why we've got the private sector um, giving a hand as well. So you will find that there are many organizations, uh, private sectors that have been uh, setting up goals and targets to support the national goals, yeah, in terms of the 70 goals and 169 uh, targets. So uh, they have found that they also have a role in play to play here uh, and uh, to make sure that no one is left behind, yeah. Other than that, now, of course, there is all this talk about what kind of an economy do we want? Um, Shinwei started off talking about the green economy. And part and parcel of this, we also talk about the circular economy. There is a push, there is a big push, especially in European countries, to get corporations, organizations, manufacturers to come up with products that will generate the most minimal waste. Yeah? We want to get rid of waste. And the waste can be solid waste, hazardous waste, waste in terms of emissions, discharges, or waste in terms of energy loss. So organizations are being pushed to think about products when you are designing your products. Think about how much of recyclable material can I use as an input to my product, yeah? And how can I design my product in a way that it can be remanufactured, it can be easily repaired, it can be reused. Finally, when my user uses it, uh, they don't have to discharge directly to the landfill. It can still be recovered. It can be uh, reused, recycled, etc. The whole point is to get rid of this as far as possible. So all this while we have been following this linear economy where we just, uh, we call it, we take, make and dispose. Yeah. But we want to go towards this donut that is going around. Yeah. Circular. Don't look at this uh, too long. You may get hypnotized. Yeah. So businesses have understood, you know, based on that context, what they have, they, they can't go on like this. No, uh, they can't do business as usual anymore. They need to think about sustainability, again, because of image reputation. There are opportunities, there's a big push because of climate change to move towards renewables. So we hear things like, you know, Petronas uh, investing into startups that are looking at uh, solar panels because of the uh, um, legislation. And of course, to address uh, any stakeholder dissatisfaction, okay? So they understand they need to think about supporting growth, but we only have finite natural resources. They need to think about how to ensure this uh, development and stay in business. So in the business sector, among the investor uh, uh, community, uh, how do I know whether you are actually doing something about sustainability? Yeah? So businesses are forced to uh, report on their performance in terms of environment, social and governance. So that investors, so that stakeholders can understand your status with regards to sustainability. And these are reported in their annual reports or they are reported in their uh, sustainability reports. Yeah? So the ESG indicators are used to monitor performance of these organizations. And very interestingly, what happened was over the COVID period, uh, when an analyst did an a analysis of companies who did okay, who didn't do okay on the S&P index, yeah? these are all you know, share and all that. What they found was, yes, everybody did badly, you know, the points dropped, 
But ESG leaders, those who were performing, yeah, those who have strong ESG practices, did much better globally and in the US compared to the ESG laggards, right? So those companies that were already on this journey, they were doing better than those that are not on this journey. So being on the sustainability journey, uh, practicing ESG uh, practices actually helped companies uh, to uh, overcome yeah, the, the problems that came about with, uh, with uh, COVID. Um, opportunities, uh, please don't try to read all this. It's just to show you that the companies that have gone, uh, joined, uh, hopped onto the sustainability bandwagon also have found opportunities. So for example, Nike, they came up with a shoe called the Fly Knit, which looked at uh, using specialized yarn, which re required minimum labor and reducing waste, right? So there are opportunities. In Penang itself, we have a Dutch company called Teleplan, that is leading circular economy. They are providing services whereby it promotes circular economy. They provide services to repair and uh, recover yeah, value uh, material from the electronics uh, equipment, etc. They are produced in Penang itself. So let's look at Penang, what's the problem and uh, why this is happening in Penang. If you look at this uh, chart, most of your EE uh, sector if you look at the value adding uh, curve, you are here. Yeah? You're not so much at the design uh, kind of things or the marketing branding. You're more here at the manufacturing. You do a lot of uh, assembly and testing. Yeah? You have a lot of companies doing assembly and testing, but this is where the value add goes. Yeah? High value products are towards the left of the chain, designing and all that. But Penang is still here where you do a lot of manufacturing. So organizations have to understand if you are stuck here, yeah, maybe for whatever reason, you know, you don't have the uh, capitals that you require. But this is where all those sustainability issues come in. You know, you need a lot of labor. It's a very manual process. Uh, you will be creating a lot of discharges, right? Uh, uh, you will be using a lot of resources, natural resources, because that is the nature of your, um, your business. Long term, what Penang needs to think about is to move towards this direction go towards the value add uh, processes yeah stay away from here but as long as you are stuck here you need to really think about these sustainability issues you really need to uh, address them and there are lots of ways to do that yeah okay Shinwei, i think i'm done so thank you amarjit thank you i was nearly hypnotized by a moving donut but that's not <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting, uh, short and sweet presentation on business sustainability and the yeah. fact that businesses who are practicing, you know, ESR are more resilient to threats to unexpected events compared to non, non, uh, to, to the target. Okay, great. So before we move on to the next presenta presenters, I've I was you know even despite this being our third webinar, I'm still get too excited. I forgot to talk about the housekeeping rules. So if you have any question, you uh, please put it on the chat box, chat room. We will uh, then present to uh, the speakers, and also we will be sharing all the presentation slides with all of you who have registered to to participate today. And we will also be putting up a recording of the whole uh, webinar on YouTube. And yes, sorry about, about, the, uh, about you know, forgetting to talk about this before. So now we move on to Ms. Catherine Chua. Uh, she will be enlightening us about her thoughts on green tourism, why do we need it, and how, how, how do we achieve it in, in Penang. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, hi. Can you see me? <laughs> um... We can oh, see okay. your screen, I think. Oh, you can see my screen, but you can't see me. Is that? You oh, no, no, no. Me? Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, you, can you share screen? You want me to share screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. We okay. see you now. And you, do you see me? You don't need to see me, I suppose. You can okay. show us. <laughs> no, that's, well, that, that's pretty funny pretty. because I tried to and I couldn't. It's saying that you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Right. So anyway, I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Catherine. All right. Yeah. Hi, good Go morning, ahead. everyone. Um, and thanks, uh, PGC, for this opportunity. 
Um, so today I'm just going to be sharing some thoughts about green tourism. Um, you know, for the last 16 years, I've ran this little company called Tropical Spice Garden, um, which has the benefit, which has had the wonderful benefit of, you know, being caretakers of this lovely piece of land in Penang. So our, our content, the content of what we do is, you know, in, in its sense green, but you know, our, our practices and, and what we do um, with the space, I think that conversation has really only taken off uh, in a more serious way in, in, the, in the more recent years. And, um, and I feel, you know, this, the whole pandemic caused a, a stop, like a really long pause for everyone, um, but especially so for people in the tourism industry. You know, I mean, it was within the, the Penang uh, community, Penang tourism community it was an absolute standstill, right? So, and it's, it was a very, it was a very profound time, well, um, for me at least, um, as we thought about, you know, our excessive lives and where we could shave off, where we could be more sustainable moving forward. And, and I think, um, you know, when we talk about resetting and, uh, yeah, resetting to this new normal, I think the idea for me is that we don't, I, we don't, I, I don't want to see anyway, a resetting to, to what we had previously. And I think now is an opportune time to, to reset really to a new normal, to a more sustainable time. And, you know, and I think the whole, the whole global pause forced us to rethink how we look at travel, um, you know, to consider a more slower and more thoughtful approach to travel and not this kind of manic jumping around city to city, see how many, you know, cities we can cram in, you know, the idea of cruise tourism, over tourism, um, and on all of that for me just forced me to, to relook all of this and, um, and to really, you know, look at travel as um, where travelers come uh, to experience a more authentic connection with the city, with the, with the city's history, with its culture, with its people. Um, and, and that's kind of tourism. Uh, for me anyway, is what Penang should be branding itself on. You know, we should, we should move away from the masses, the numbers, the overcrowding, which then, you know, impact on our, on our resources. But to think about tourists, you know, higher, higher end tourists who, who bring a more positive impact. Um, That I just covered that. <laughs> okay, let me see. When I talk, when we talk, and, um, and really at the end of the day, for me, it came down to the tourism shouldn't be something that's staged. Tourism, for me, will naturally flow out of a community. Um, so, for example, if a community, a city, or town is sustainable, naturally you will breed sustainable tourism. Sustainable cities beget sustainable tourism. If you're if your state policies are already looking after your land use, you know, circular economy, use of um, resources, your, the transportation issues, marine life, you know, all the, if these things are already part of our community in our city in the way we function, um, this will naturally spill out into to tourism and um, it will it'll have a knock-on effect. And I believe that's what, that's what Penang Penang's tourism vision, it's, it's something that needs to be set from above. It's a vision that needs to be set from our state, even from our federal, you know, where, where you, you, want, you want to have lasting effects. You want to have, you want to bring about tourism that's sustainable. And, and how do you do that? You know, do you, is it about building, um, you know, lovely uh, theme parks, for example, or, but, or is it about really looking at the history of the people the culture and, and 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 diving deep into into those assets our natural assets of, of the island and i believe these authentic travelers are what is good for our destination ex seeking these ex experiences rather than a sterilized version of ent entertainment tourism which is faddish which i believe um invites trouble because it's you know mass overcrowding um you know, depleting resources and um you know, something like COVID hits and you're not resilient at all, you know, so um, 
things to think about. You know, when you think about Penang, um, you know, we're an island state. So what are, what are our, you know, what, 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 what's our history? I mean, we are an island state. We're surrounded by waters. What, what is our marine history like? You know, we, you know, Penang ranked the third highest in fish food production in 2017. Um, so what are we doing to protect our food security, the biodiversity of our marine life, um, our local economy and the fishermen? Um, so when we make decisions to, for example, reclaim, and there's a lot of it going on in Penang these days, um, how, how, how is that sustainable first for the city and, and then for tourism? Could we not be focusing safeguarding these treasures, protection area, uh, rebranding these communities to include maybe a fisherman's market, you know, selling Malaysian fish eateries. I mean, you can imagine the south part of the island, you know, that's where your, your heaviest fish breeding grounds are, for example. You know, could, could, could a sustainable tourism product grow out of these and, and thereby sustaining food security for, for the island and for the rest of Malaysia, as well as creating a sustainable tourism product. So it's looking at things like that. You know, Penang also has a rich transport history. You know, we used to have trams. Penang has a spice history. I mean, we are the spice garden and that's the kind of thing that we try to, we try to tell people about, right? It's an, looking through the eyes of, of Penang's history through the, through the trade of spices. So all these different histories that have um, uh, contributed to, to who we are as a people, as a community, I believe these are the rich stories that, you know, tourism should, should grow from because this is our genuine, authentic history. So tourism has, for me, uh, for sustainability within tourism context has, you know, two, two huge components, the environmental sustainability and the human sustainability of it, you know. Um, sustainability needs to, needs to both, you know, it's, it, it is, and they're both as strong as each other. It's the human, it's the hu human, um, factor as well as the environmental factor and, and you know all the things it runs these the mental factor um, and so these are you know it must come together and I feel like in the last 16 years just being in tourism it's felt sometimes as if tourism kind of stands in silo and it's very very isolated from um, from the other conversations surrounding water, land, transport, etc. you know, but it's, um, and I don't think this, this can happen anymore. We, we need to change this model. It needs to, we need to talk. Um, uh, let's move my slide along. I just, I just flashed up this slide, you know, I talked about, you know, Penang having a rich uh, a transport history, you know, so um, this was, this is a slide out of Hong Kong, you know, trams have become uh, synonymous with, with the cityscape, as in San Francisco, you know, and uh, so, you know, now the, the, the transport master plan has, has been hugely controversial, controversial in Penang. And, um, but, you know, can we, can we look at, can we relook at, at transport? You know, we have, we, we are huge bus manufacturers, we are leading bus manufacturers, and we actually, in Malaysia, supply and manufacture buses to Hong Kong, and yet we are underutilizing our own technology within our own state. Um, you know, the ride, public transport ridership is at what, 3%? It's, you know, it's hugely low. There's huge potential to grow this and at the same time create a, a tourism product. Um, so things to think about, uh, new systems that are being introduced. So our public, our currently our transport master plan, again, you know, it's, it's very road heavy development of new roads, LRT heavy, it's, you know, everything about it is very, seems to be very unsustainable. Can we look at, you know, systems like this, trackless trams, again, it's a progression from our, our rich transport history in Penang has always had. Um, this is a picture I, I found, you know, this idea of fishermen's markets developing where, you know, people, you know, come to the south part of the island to seek out fresh fish, to seek out variety. You know, tourists come to see variety of the ways that Malaysians create um, our fresh fish 
So it's, again, it's supporting the humans factor. It's supporting our local economy. It's supporting our fishermen, which is a heritage trade, as well as creating an exciting space for tourists. Uh, Chao Kuan Yao in September uh, talked about the uh, service industry having surpassed the manufacturing industry and said it's our top industry. This came out of the Star newspaper. Um, so, you know, if the service industry is which mostly con is contributed from tourism is a top industry. We, we really better have a sustainable plan in action because it's, um, you know, it's no longer just, just the tourism industry. It's, it's the tourism industry. How, you know, more 51, 52% of Penang's GDP rests on tourism. So it, it becomes a very um, major conversation and, uh, and it needs to start talking um, within the other, um, sectors in, in Penang and that really, you know, what, what, what more perfect time than now post, post COVID or within COVID. And so I started to think about, you know, what is the measure of, a, of successful tourism? Um, you know, in the last 16 years, the conversation has always been about numbers. It is hugely number driven. Everything we do from state to private, you know, all the associations and the meetings that we attend, it's always about numbers. The numbers coming in, are we on the rise, airport numbers, airport arrivals, cruise ship numbers, numbers to your destination. It's never ever anything else, it, you know, and, and just, I'm just thinking, you know, as a, as a business owner, seeing that shift of conversation will take a big drastic measure. Um, and it really needs something. I, I feel it needs to, yes, it needs to be bottom up. I, 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 I take on board what Amajit had said earlier, and it, it, that the state alone can't do it. But the state has to set, has to has to really embrace this this change, you know, and uh, and and really see it as potential. Um, you know, even f the financial viability of of branding a green tourism for Penang has got huge potential, and it must come from the state down, uh, um, from top top down you know um, and I think I believe there are more and more players on the ground like the spice garden the habitat you know we are there are rumblings on the ground I, I believe that there, there can be um, a, a real great synergy there but we must shift away from numbers and volume if we're going to talk about sustainability um, crowd capacity controls will have to be implemented and it's a it's a painful thing as a business owner to say this but it's it is the truth you know we we need to start looking at numbers how many numbers can you can you really sustainably have within georgetown um, when the cruise ships come in how many places you know how um how many numbers can georgetown as a, as a community hold before we start turning away cars ca um, can cars should cars be allowed in the a unesco heritage zone you know do we need to pedestrianize there's a lot of questions um uh, surrounding this you know um uh, yeah, where am I? Oh, so just another slide, you know, I mean, I was, I was going to say, you know, like, do we, do we ever have conversations like, well, how much carbon emission did your bus per you know, churn out this morning or over the weekend? And, you know, it's just, it's just the little things that we need to take, take seriously. I'm, I'm constantly fighting with uh, tourist buses outside. Please turn off your engine, you know. Uh, you know, the irony of like a busload of tourists coming into the Spice Garden and then, you know, you've got your, you've got this, this bus, you know, churning, uh, you know, diesel fumes into the air, into the gardens. Um, you know, my staff's breathing it in, <laughs> their customers are breathing in and it's just, it's just ironic. And, and then, you know, this idea of no, no, cannot because uh, we have to keep the air cons running so that when the guests come back in, they're comfortable. So, you know, we need to really rethink about all this and you know to what extent are we prepared to give up our comforts to what extent you know are we prepared to uh strap in a little bit in order to think about the bigger picture so as amajit pointed out um there are a ton of uh definitions out there on sustainable organization that looks at like conserving environmental resources, respecting, preserving, and addressing the needs of the visitors and industry whilst providing socio-economic benefit to all. So it's, it's all, it's all inclusive, it's all inclusive, you know, you cannot, you cannot have one without the other. 
Um, I remember I sat on one of PGC's working groups uh, with, for marine, um, marine sustainability, and I remember uh, Dr. Zulfika from CMAX. You know, he's, he put it so succinctly and it was so lovely. He said, you know, if you, whatever, whatever, um, whatever you want to do, whatever development you want to do, uh, he spoke about this in the, in the context of reclamation, I remember, it has to leave a better, um, you have to leave the place that you've been working on or developing on in a better state and not worse. Um, it's like when you renovate your house, you, you, don't, you don't renovate your house at the expense of something getting worse. It's, it always has to leave a positive impact, a better impact. And I think that's a very simple principle to go by. You know, when, you, when we develop in a certain way, who's taking the hit for it? You know, are, is, are the people of Penang taking the hit in, a, in, a, in somewhat a bad way? Is the environment taking a hit? We need to make, be making decisions to make sure that everything is being, is being brought along sustainably and well. Uh, again, the SDG goals, I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's the, the United Nations have identified seven, 17 SDGs within the tourism um, aspect of it. They, uh, it. They've identified uh, goals 8, 12 and 14 as um, particularly pertinent uh, as tourism making the greatest impact in these in these um, three areas. So decent work, economic growth, responsible consumption and production, and life below water. So, you know, and again, Penang is an island state, life below water is so, is, is such a huge potential there. So with this in mind, I just feel the timing is, is crucial. And I feel like because we were forced into um, this global stop, it made us rethink and see things differently. And we realized that we could do time, I, I believe, for, for Penang to rebrand itself in order to, we, knew, we, we need to catch eyeballs of, you know, world travelers. How can we set ourselves different? Um, you know, within the region, we would be, we would be game changers if we could start to brand Penang um, as a sustainable city, a green city, and it will come into in alignment with what's set out there by the UN and the SDGs. It will, it will come into complete alignment with Penang 2030's agenda. Um, it would give us, I mean, we would be creating a city that would be in for the long term, you know, where, where, where the folks of Penang can enjoy a sustainable life, uh, as, and, and, and not feel under threat um, with over tourism um, because these are beginning you know even within the cruise ship industry these are these are some of the things and thoughts which we struggle with right and like as, as a you know, di digitalizing for sustainability again huge potential here to um, to see how you know the digital era the, the, the smart economy um, can completely support the Sustainable, sustainability conversation that we need to start having and about attracting high value, low impact tourism. You know, we want people to, we want travelers, we want more and more travelers who come to the island because they, they love to see, you know, our, our history, our culture, our, our arts, our crafts. So what are we doing as a state to, to, to dig deep into those histories and, and bring those forward and not and being more selective with um, the kind of tourism products that we uh, allow and, and, and reinforce and, and sell. So, and you know, going green eventually, there are cost saving measures involved, you know, there are features and energy saving features, water saving features, which eventually long term can help to cut costs, you know, so again, again, this has to be financially viable. And I, I believe this is, um, there's huge potential here to do that. Oh, I just brought this out. This is I, I was just searching around, and this is this is site. Um, it's called Eco B and B. It's a, like an eco-friendly alternative to Airbnb, and you know, just even just ten simple um, conditions to for your business to be on this uh, Eco B and B, and you know, it's just setting setting those standards um, and allowing um, the tourism industry to buy into this and and start to brand it. We, we can start. 
you know, even if it's something like, a, you know, re reduction of plastic, that would be a huge thing for the, uh, for the tourism industry already. And I mean, we could, we could really s s um, set ourselves um, a standard within the region um, against Thailand, against Singapore. It, yeah. Uh, in closing, this was our recovery campaign um, after COVID hit. Um, as I said, it was very profound for me and I, I found myself um, asking myself, how, where does our business go from here? How are we going to make this through? And, and the response from, from me and the team was to go back to basics, to go to return to the earth, to return to the soil, return to community um, and build from there. And um, so with that came a whole host of things that happened like a community garden space is now opened up within the gardens um we, you know we, so we allow volunteers to come to the gardens and actually get their hands dirty with us and it, it's just kind of re rejigged our whole mind so it is it is doable um and I, and I suppose just in closing i just want to say that this is a journey that i'm on as well so i'm not here to preach about you know um but it's something i I'm excited for and I'm excited to continue to dialogue with PGC and the state and how we can really together um, make a difference here. So I think that's it actually for me. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Shall um, I stop sharing? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can stop okay. sharing. But thank you for, for your insights on your thoughts on, on green tourism. I mean, as you say, it is an important sector. And just to sort of dispel some myths or myth outside, when you talked about green tourism, it's not just ecotourism, because to many, to many people and even to you know state players as well, you talk about green tourism, they thought it's only ecotourism. It's not. It's also about uh, upgrading our hotels, you know, our restaurants to make sure that uh, uh, there's energy efficiency, water efficiency, and so on and so forth. And this is about, I guess, it's it's about. Uh, long term if we want to keep Penang as an attractive destination what can we do to maintain to to actually make Penang retain its uh, its value so it's all it's sort of interconnected so without much uh, delay I'll, I'll then move the, to Mr. Zabri he is the like I said acting director of urban services of uh, MBSP MBSP has been uh, very progressive a local council, I would say, in the whole of Malaysia, not just in Penang, it's in the whole of Malaysia. They have introduced a whole lot of targets, I mean, targets that are very impressive. Like, for example, they want to achieve 75% um, uh, of uh, recycling by 2030. I think, is it 2030? Please, please correct me later, Mr. Zabri. And you have, uh, you want to turn MBSP into a carbon neutral city by 2030. And you have also renewable energy targets. I mean, all these are really progressive and, and I think uh, one of the very, very few councils, local councils in Malaysia has, has done. So, uh, and excitingly, we heard that uh, MBSP is going to introduce circular economy roadmap for MBSP by the end of the year. So it would be really great to get a bit of a, a peep from you about what this is about. And maybe you can also tell us why MBSP is doing all this. Thank you, Mr. Zabri, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shinwe. So let me try to share the screen first. All right, so can everyone see the slide? Yes. All right. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank PGC for inviting me to represent the City Council of Brown Uh I think by having me here, it's just to remind everyone that Penang State is not the on only about Penang Island, eh, but also us here in Brown I tend to see that the, our first two speakers, they almost forget that Brown Pai is part of Penang as well. <laughs> All right. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my mayor, Datuk Suwaya Jerozali, for his effort in carving a transformational path for Subram Prai because we are targeting to be a sustainable city by 2030. Like what you have mentioned earlier, Dr. Shinwe, we are targeting to become a low carbon city by 2022 and also a carbon neutral city by 2030. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Climate change has been a hot topic globally since three decades ago. Countless convention and summit held in order to mitigate the impact of climate change, but unfortunately, nothing changes except for the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. So you can see that in order for us to tackle climate change issue, it is very vital for us to know how uh, our emissions status is about. So I'm very proud to say that Sabrang Prai is the first city in Malaysia that have a city-wide carbon inventory which dated back to 2010. So we have accounted our carbon emissions for the past 10 years. So that is what we have been doing in Sabrang Prai. But before I go into details about what we have been doing, I think it's better for me to share the best practices that been happening in Sabrang Prai. Okay, so you can see, uh, as you, Everyone know that Penang have already have a policy about segregation at source, which started in 2016, all right? So we have the highest recycling rate in the country with 51.64% in 2019, and we are targeting in 2020, it's supposed to reach around 60% because our target in 2022 is to get 70% recycling rate. And by 2030, we are targeting to be a zero waste city. All right. So as you can see, these are uh, some of the programs that have been recognized by the Malaysia Board of Records because uh, as you can, as everyone know, Sabrang Prai is the best city in Malaysia. All right, everyone. <coughs> these are all the activities that have been carried in Sabrang Prai. We have upcycling. We have recycling, we have program with FNN, okay? We also have a policy to no single plastic bag. Uh, this is about Recycle for Life. We have introduced a Recycle for Life system in Sabrang Prai, which we encourage people to recycle more. Okay, when we talk about today's topic, green economy. Green economy is the only concept if we want to decouple uh, economical activities with uh, carbon emissions. So when we talk about green economy, it should have three components, which are low emission, resource efficient, and socially inclusive, All right? Without these three elements, uh, we cannot get uh, green economy. So let me share what we are trying to do. Eh? Okay, in January 2020, Sabrang Prai have already launched a Sabrang Prai Climate Action Strategy which aims to reduce our, to mitigate our, the impact of climate change in Sabrang Prai and also to set a target in future. Okay, we are, in this document, it's actually, we have accounted in the near 10 years from now, what is going to happen in Sabrang Prai. So from there, we have already identified certain, certain key sectors area. One of the key sectors area is waste and the circular economy. As you can see, um, the waste and circular economy through this uh, particular sector, we are targeting to reduce 50% of emissions uh, from waste sectors. So, uh, in order for us to achieve the zero waste city by 2030, we are target to have a circular economy roadmap, like what mentioned by Shinwei earlier. Uh, so, we are um, hopefully by this December, we will have a circular economy roadmap. A circular economy is an economy system that of closed loop in which raw material component and product lose their value as little as possible. Renewable energy sources are used and system thinking is at one core. So, Sabrang Prai, we have been thinking, when we talk about circular economy, it should have three components. Okay, we shall, it should have a closed close cycle. It should also include the renewable energy and also a system thinking, which means that we need to see the whole ecosystem as one system. Everyone in this ecosystem should play their particular roles, not only uh, government, not only the private facilities, but also every single players in the city. They also have their particular roles. As you can see now, uh, most of the city, most of the economy are in the terms of linear economy, okay? Which means that we take, we make, and then we dispose. So we need to change from a linear economy to a circular economy. That's why in 2016, MBSP has already come with a MBSP smart consumption models, which known as 8Rs, ladies and gentlemen. 
when we mention it as many people they mock us this they think that mbsp is trying to achieve more than what we should okay people are talking about three hours and four hours but we are talking about eight hours but it's not not the issues the issue is that with these eight hours is the only possible thing for us to achieve a secular economy ladies and gentlemen all right as you can see this is our waste data for the past 10 years okay in 2019 it's about 1.15 million tons of waste have been produced in sabran prime which means that around 1.800 tons per day of waste have been sent to the landfill every single day Okay, out of this 1,800, it's about 1,000 tons of waste is coming from industry. So we need to rethink the way for us to change from a linear economy, which at the end result is to go to send the, all the waste to the landfill to a circular economy where we turn this waste into resources. Okay, so in that, our circular economy roadmap will have eight components, which known as key performance areas, Landfill reliance, recycling rates, food waste diversion, single use plastic management, CND waste, e waste, renewable energy, and also water potential. All right. So, as you can see, landfill reliance. Sebram Pai, we have uh, been investing in landfill around 15 million per year, the cost for us to manage the landfill. So, if we can reduce the landfill reliance by 60%, at least 8 million can be spent to a development in Sebram Prime. And we are targeting to achieve 75% recycling rate by 2030. And for food waste, we are targeting to have a food waste processing plant, which means that we need to have a waste to energy plant, waste to compost and waste to protein plant by 2030. Okay, and also we are trying to have a roadmap for single-use plastic for us to eliminate plastic, uh, single-use plastic by 2030. All right, for CND waste treatment and recycling facilities, we are targeting to set it by 2022 in our Pulau Burung. And also we have our e-waste collection center. And for renewable energy, we are targeting to have an energy extraction from our Pulau Burung landfill from phase one and phase two by 2025 and also waste to energy plant to be set at Ampanjaja transfer station and Pulau Burung by 2030. So ladies and gentlemen, so like what I said earlier, Sebram Pai have been doing a lot of things in combating climate change because as everyone knows, we have always been the leader in environmental and waste management sector in Malaysia. We have been mitigating the impact of climate change since two decades ago. So I hope this is what I can share because our circular economy roadmap is still progressing. Once we have finished our circular economy roadmap, I will share further with you guys. So I hope if you guys have any uh, question, you can ask me later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shinwe. Thank you, Mr. Zabri. Great. Thank you, Mr. Zabri, uh, for sharing with us the vision and what you have done. And it is indeed a very progressive uh, uh, local council and we have obtained a, a copy of your MBSP climate ambition you know we have made long tables detailing the targets you have for 2022 2030 2050 you have all sorts of targets you have targets for industrial sector co2 reduction transport sector you know all these are really you know impressive and we are very ex uh, excited about it and we always look for uh, opportunities to work with the local councils uh, to see what we can you know uh, do together to 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 help each other in terms of uh, achieving your targets so now all the presentations uh, are done. Uh, we have collected a few uh, questions and please keep the questions coming in if you, if you, if you have. But we have uh, maybe a, a very short one very quickly for Mr. Zabri. This is asked by Mr. Deep from SEDA. Uh, this Penang Kisi Council MBSP has established GHG deduction targets and timeline. So going carbon neutral by 50, 2050. So as we heard, MBSP has target to become uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and zero carbon by 20, 2050. Am, am yes. I right? Uh, yeah, yes, correct. Low carbon what city, would be, yeah. yeah. 
And, and I know that uh, one of my colleagues in PGC, we are trying to set up a, a carbon inventory for the whole of uh, uh, Penang. At the moment, we don't have that data. We don't have uh, uh, information about how much we emit from what sectors and, and what's the potential for CO2 reduction. We don't have all this information at the moment, even though MBSP, you do have your own system. You have been collecting CO2 emission data since a while ago. So you, you do have that uh, baseline and database while the, the whole state doesn't yet. So PGC is in the process of creating that uh, inventory. So, uh, and uh, another question, maybe for both Mrs. Abri and Catherine, asked by uh, Jean Lee, is what's the next step to rebrand Penang as a sustainable city? How can individuals uh, play a part in pushing for it? So maybe Mrs. Abri can start first based on the many years of experience of MBSP pushing for various uh, campaigns, you know, the upcycling, the recycling. Uh, how, how do you get individuals involved? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the key for us is that partnership, All right? Uh, for us to to achieve what we have achieved so far is because we have partnership with a lot of people. Okay, it's not about the single entity. It's not about we have partnership with NGOs, but we really spell out which type of partnership that we want. We want partnership with institution. We we need partnership from the academician. We need partnership from the people from the ground. So we spell it out. So we look for the partnership. So that's the key. If you want to transform Penang into a better, so we need to include everyone. So as you can see, in Penang, we have a model that we know as GRPB, Penang model. Okay, Gender Responsive Participatory Budgeting. That is the platform where we involve every stakeholders in Penang. And particularly in Sebrang Pri, we involve everyone in every detail things okay for example in 2016 when our datuk bandar uh, he want to have the strategic planning he's actually he have around 121 meetings with the stakeholders just to have our uh, strategic planning for the, for the five years so that's the key partnerships when we involve them in decision making so they will also involve in all the uh, programs all the events that we need to have in our city Thank you. How do you get involved? Is it through questionnaire? Is it through uh, public hearings? What sort of um, Yeah, questionnaire, public hearing. We have a town hall session. We have a di dialogue budgets. We go to the ground to every single MPK case. Okay, so we have meetings with all the uh, uh, local players, okay, local leaders. So all the YBs are involved there. So they bring their people. So that, that's where the, the engagement. It's not only we, MBSB, it's not that we, we need people to come to our office, but we also can go to the ground. We can go to your house to listen to you. Uh, that's Thank the you. key. Catherine, how about, how about, how, how would tourist, tourism sector get people to be excited about, you know, new type of tourism, get involved? How do you talk to your customers about it? How do you, you know, get your customers involved in the first place? And how do you get local communities, you know, in your vicinity to, to be, you know, involved in, in that discussion. Catherine. Catherine, you need to unmute your mic. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to figure this out myself, Shinwei. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, I mean, for us, uh, what we have done is we have gone community. This is our, this is our, the new thing we're trying to, to build now is building community. For me, that's building resilience and it's something it's something that we stand for. And I feel like over the past 10 years, we moved away from it and now we're being forced to come back to it. And I'm, but I'm glad for it. I'm really glad for this revisioning. And so, you know, because we're engaging community, you know, we're just reaching out through our normal social platforms, social media platforms, you know, and it's about the decisions as a company that you make. Right. So like, so now for the first time, I'm, I, my, my doors are free. So you, every third weekend you can come for free, but in return you come and work on the land. So it's about the decisions that you make as a company, I suppose, and what you're doing. So uh, because I've decided to create a community garden, um, that's me engaging and identifying people within my, my literal community in Batu Fringi, Tanjung Bunga, Telok Bahang, 
um, identifying individuals who buy into this and who want to be a part of this and who want to benefit from this as well. You know, they harvest, they grow, etc. So, I mean, that on that on that scale, this is what I'm doing. Um, but I'm just thinking, you know, I'm also an individual. I'm also a citizen. How, what, yeah, how would I engage in a sustainability talk? And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's not always the easiest way for an individual to engage in sustainability conversations. You know, I have the privilege because I run the Spice Gardens and I'm very public in the tourism sector, you know, PGC contact us and we can, you know, get involved there. And, you know, I feel very privileged for that. But as an individual, how do you do it? Um, the one thing that comes to my mind, I suppose, is to stay engaged with, you know, because a lot is happening in Penang right now. We're like, we're steaming ahead and there's lots of decisions being made, uh, major ones, you know, that are affecting our environment, are affecting, you know, you know, you, you know, so the, the individuals need to be, um, need to stay abreast of what's happening, right? So know what RCM has, has, uh, his agenda, 2030 Penang Green Agenda. It's stated right there. And so in a way, hold whole state accountable to the plans and the vision that they've laid out. You know, is the master plan, is the, the, tur the tourism master plan, is the transport master plan and all the other decisions that are meet, being made in the state, does it all line up to the Penang Green Agenda? Does it all line up to us, uh, the UN SDGs? And if they don't, you know, write in a letter to the press, you know, go on to state uh, Facebook pages and, and, and voice out, well, you know, qu question, because um, it's interesting when you read all the dialogues, you know, the state are under the impression that everyone supports everything they do, but it's not really the case. And so the more we, we just voice out as an individual, that helps. And then, you know, just look for opportunities. And if you can't find anyone who's doing something in community, be, be the one to, to start. So within your community, can we do, can we move towards uh, a community garden within your, you know, so that we reduce uh, compost, food waste, uh, you know, look, look for ideas and you'll be amazed. And I think now is a time, this whole COVID thing has just pulled community together. And I think there are people within your neighborhood even who are willing and want to do something. So maybe you have to be the one to, to do that rather than looking for um, a head. You know what I mean? Like be the head to do it. Yeah. Great. I mean, we, uh, from, from PGC, we are going to send some proposals to the state about what are the first steps we can take to sort of move slightly moving our tourism sector to its more sustainable pathway and we look forward to working with industry players as you said before you know industry players the conventional thinking is numbers numbers but we need to shift from that mode of thinking so we will need the support uh, of, of industry players so your your colleagues your peers so we look forward to working with you and, and like-minded people and uh, uh, let me look at uh, another Question. So I will address this question to Amarjit. Amarjit, can you please give us some examples of how a, par a particular company, you know, how, how maybe they, they have seen transformation in the company, whether it's in the culture or the products or the uh, profit lines or whatever, how they have changed dealing with, you know, incorporating sustainability into their, their company and then how that has helped him. How, just to create a concrete example of how things can happen. It's not just on theory, ready is something that you you know, on their on their revenues and stuff like that. So maybe give us one example of how that has that, that has been achieved. Oh, okay. Um if I focus uh, on uh, Malaysian companies, yeah, because we are Malaysians. Uh, you have all the MNCs and all that and basically MNCs they just do what is directed by the mothership in some country but if you look at local Malaysian companies unfortunately we have a lot of legards yeah Malaysian companies local companies uh, uh, you need to bring the stick or there needs to be a disaster before they wake up and do something that's the nature yeah but things are I think changing a little bit uh, I think the biggest change you can see is uh, in industries where these sustainability related impacts are very obvious. You know, remember I spoke about uh, forced labor, human rights and business. We speak about climate change and all that. So there are certain industries in Malaysia that are, if all that is in their face. Yeah. So I, I guess the most uh, popular one with all these issues is the uh, oil palm industry 
And I see Kelvin Leong just came on and he, he probably knows what I'm talking about. But uh, from the oil palm in, this, in the oil palm industry, uh, there's been so much pressure from consumers, not local consumers, but you know, in other countries. So much so that uh, if you look at companies like Syme Darby, IOI and all that, you need to read, read about these stories in their reports, in their annual reports or in their sustainability reports. That's where they, they tell you the story of what they've been doing and how it's been benefiting them. So these players in the oil palm sector, they have done, uh, I, I, I'm an environmentalist at heart, you know, when you talk about oil palm, I'll go all, uh, uh, but then I have seen there's so much initiative being put by our own companies. So they have been taking so many measures, you know, to address things like uh, labor issues, uh, making sure they don't keep people's passports, you know, that's not allowed, uh, you know, in terms of mitigation. I remember I had to, I had to provide some training in the oil palm sector to harvesters, to fruit harvesters, to talk to them about climate change, because that's required uh, from the oil palm sector. Even the harvester needs to understand what is climate change. You imagine that, you know, these small holders and all that need to understand that much. So these things, you know, examples. Another example is uh, if you look at the FNN report, FNN, they, they make beverages. Uh, very interesting, they have gone full blown with circular economy. They even have plants where there's zero waste, no waste at all. Everything is either reused or recycled, just no waste at all. I've actually been to a company in, uh, in KL, which is in the electronic sector as well. Their target is zero waste. And they told me, Amarjit, the only waste we have now are cigarette butts. That's it. They've got rid of it. Yeah. So there are many examples out there. I, I can give, I can go on and on. But I advise if you really want to know uh, about them, read their reports. But the, the sad part is this is only happening because somebody took the rotan, you know, like the Bursa Malaysia, our stock exchange said, you must report. Therefore, in order to report, you must do. Yeah. So even property developers, you know, I've been, I've been asked to speak to board of directors about sustainability. I have one session coming up, two hours I've been given. So it's, it's, it's moving because Malaysia, you know, we, we are moving towards a high income uh, economy. So we cannot run away from these problems anymore. It's there in our faces. Yeah? The more business we do internationally, we have to wake up to this fact. So I advise everyone, if you want to know what companies are doing, uh, Google their annual reports and their sustainability reports, and you'll see all kinds of examples there. Great. Thanks, Majid. So another question for you. How can NGOs and, and the state government play a role in, in encouraging the implementation of circular economy in the business sector, given the current uh, sort of... Uh, economic difficulties due to COVID-19. So what are the things that either state government or NGO can do to help spur that sort of as far, transition? As far as governments are concerned, there's only one way you can make anything happen. You need to come up with regulations. That's it. That is your role. Come up with regulations and then enforce them 100%. Then you see how these guys uh, behave. All right, no regulation, they are not going to do anything. I have, I have seen this with companies, yeah. Either it's regulations or it is a customer pressure. These two things will sort them out immediately, okay. So that is government's role. Uh, NGO's role, unfortunately, in Malaysia, we have this culture in the corporate sector. Uh, NGOs are seen as something bad bad news, you know, they don't even want to be associated with NGOs, sometimes, depending, yeah, but if you look at the oil palm sector, they, they are quite friends with NGO because they have no choice. But NGOs, again, they can act as a pressure group, yeah, if like an individual like you and I, we don't know how to express ourselves, join up with NGOs. I, I see a lot of questions, what can I do, what can I do? Sometimes individually you can't do much. Join up with an NGO, you know, you got CAP there, you got all this, you know, Mina and everybody there. They all pressure groups. Join up with them and then do, do something, play, play a role uh, in that term. And I, I just want to highlight one thing about circular economy. When we talk about circular economy in our conversation, there's been too much focus on waste. And like what do we do about the waste, recycle? That, that's not what the focus of circular economy is. Circular economy is from the very beginning. So this is where the 
manufacturers, even the people in the tourism industry, when you want to come up with your product, Catherine, whatever you have been saying, you are talking circular economy. You know, you've already been incorporating that. From designing your product, designing your services, you're already thinking about how can I reduce the waste at the end of it. Yeah? So the focus should be there with all this manufacturing. Uh, as consumers, we should be pressuring uh, companies to think about, hey, make sure when you design products, stop, look at that. Stop using this, doing this. I cannot advertise, sorry. <laughs> stop doing, stop giving me small sachets. Come on, what are you doing, you know? That is our, our uh, that's how we use our voice. So if they start doing that, there will be no ways for Majlis Perbandaran Sebarang Perai to think about what am I going to do with this? So it, it is like that, yeah? So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amarji. I mean, when it comes to regulation, obviously, Penang being, you know, state government, a lot of times you need the whole country to adopt certain standards. Otherwise, factories who are thinking of coming to Penang, okay, we have less stringent regulations in Para, we go to Para. Right? So it is a balancing act for, for the Penang government, but we can do that if we're really serious about sort of creating a brand for Penang. There's a green, we are a green manufacturing hub. You know, you, you come, yes, the, the standards are, will be higher, but you know that when people see it's manufactured in Penang, you get that brand recognition. It, it is done, you know, in a sustainable way. So we can still move there, but it is, you know, there, there are still concerns by the state government. If we suddenly increase all our standards, you know, it's going to drive people away. But on the other hand, it might attract people who want to do that sort of things to Penang. So, so it is something that we we are also looking into at PGC, and we will be uh, using or uh, sort of using a brain on that. Let, can I just jump in at your your comment? I'm sorry, but I don't agree with you. It's it's reality. The fact that you come up with stringent laws uh, will drive away uh, investment and all that. Uh, look at around the world, yeah, all those countries with very stringent laws, look at the EU, they have extreme, they have laws to do with circular economy and people are still doing business there, yeah. So this is where we come in, we need to push that, you know, this is no such thing as, I want things cheap, yeah, things like tourism. Catherine, I just saw a comment, somebody is complaining that your entry charges are too much. I, I shall censor my thoughts. <laughs> Your product is so valuable. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This is the problem with our consumers. They do not know how to value. Yeah. Value. They value things in terms of money. Yeah. That's the first thing we need to change. Okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to. Definitely. Definitely. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. No, so how much is for you? So in your slides, right? So I was looking when you were talking about like Penang. You you made a comment like Penang has to shift from the heavy manufacturing on the right, and we got to move up, move left, which is more design and all that. So I'm just being uh, more sustainable then okay we'll just dump the manufacturing to another state or another country i mean how where where, where what are we going to be offloading to to so that we're not responsible in that i need all to china <laughs> yeah because <laughs> because <they're centric. laughs> no uh, absolutely right um i mean we want to be the silicon valley but we, are, we seem to be the silicon valley in manufacturing the actual silicon valley is the brain you know, in the U.S., the Silicon Valley is more about the thinking and the designing. That's the, that's the uh, value add part that we need to move to. So we can't be stuck in manufacturing forever. This is where the problems are. Definitely, these manufacturers will have to go somewhere else. Don't get me wrong. There are, le there are least developing countries in this world. So these investments yeah, may move there. But of course, within a strict standards, as you know, the same rules and all that should apply. And that is the nature of a business, actually, you know, a country like Malaysia, we start off at a very manually uh, oriented industries, but we have to move up the chain. So someone else will take over. 
we have a lot of uh, least developed countries like in the African continent and all that. They, they do not have a source of uh, industry. So this may move there and that would benefit them because that will bring new skills to them. They will learn up, then they will move up the chain. That, that's how, how it, will, it's, it will all uh, pan out, you know. So I don't think we should worry about that and we should really move towards a uh, high end, but we are not ready in terms of the capitals. We don't have, I wouldn't say we don't have this, uh, but the intellectual capital, maybe the financial capital and all that. But that is where the focus should be in terms of Penang. That's where we should uh, look at. Thanks, Amaji. Or, or we can aim for still having a manufacturing base. It's always good to diversify economy, but smart, you know, manufacturing or, or, or you know, better quality manufacturing. I yeah, guess. yeah, more automation and. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Abri, we have a f few questions for you because everyone is very excited about MBSPs. You know, your claim that it's the best city in the in in. In yeah, for me. for me. Yeah, you're definitely. going to get a lot of flags because of that. But uh, uh, let me just ask you a few questions first. So one question is from uh, Noor Ashrina. He, she's asking, you know, how do you, you ask people to separate the waste and into recycled and non-recyclables, but uh, when there are no, when, when there's only one common dustbin outside the house. So I guess this is for uh, terrace houses, maybe. If there's only one bin, how do you ask them to separate? And then another question, related question, is uh, about how does MBSP handle public food waste now? Right. First of all, it is the responsibility of the people themselves to prepare the dustbin in front of their house. It's not about how many types of dustbin that they need to prepare. All right. So they need just, according to our policy, they need to segregate and then we will collect every Saturday in terms of collections. But the aim is that it's not for the city council to collect the recyclable materials. It's actually to educate the people for them themselves to recycle the things at the uh, private facilities. Because you can see that we are encouraging circular economy. We want to teach people that they have the value, they can get the value out of the waste that they are producing. All right? If they segregate, they sell it to the private facilities, they can get a sum of money. All right. So if you do it as an individual, the amount of money that you receive is not sufficient enough. But that is where you need to do it collectively as an organization. Okay. For example, we have a residential association. We have Rukun Tetangga. We have uh, Persatuan Masjid and Surau and so on. So that is where if you do it collectively, it can fund the activity, the program of your society. Okay, it's not about how many dustbin that you need to prepare. It's actually to educate the people you need to segregate. But I still believe segregation, it should be at source and also it should be at landfill. So that we, we can mitigate, we can reduce the amount of plastic, the amount of waste, recyclable materials sent to the landfills. Alright, that's for the first question. For the second question, can you repeat this question? Sure, what's, uh, what's your position? How, how does NDSP handle public food waste? at the moment all right so we actually we, uh, we have our partners uh shans corporation which dealing with the food waste uh food waste management okay he the shans they will collect the food waste in spu sebrampai utara and also spt sebrampai tengah okay then they have uh, a processing site in market bagan jam pasawan bagan jam where they will uh, process into uh, compost all right so we are actually scaling up this process uh, chance uh, they, they will have their new plants in taman nagasari where they will install a 70 tons per day capacity to process a uh, food waste all right so we also thinking about uh, maybe next year we will have a more integrated system in our ampanjajar uh, transfer station where we will divert we will try to have a diversion there in our uh, transfer station which we can we be targeting to have a 50 percent of diversion which uh, it will end up to be a waste to energy plant waste to protein and also waste to compost plant so that's our target lah for us how for we want to manage the food waste so that's what we need this uh, circular economy roadmap because by having this circular economy roadmap we will have all the stakeholders to participate and also we get all the feedback from the people so that we can have 
a better understanding on how for us to manage the food waste. So we are also targeting to have a new dasar, a new policy on uh, food waste management. Yeah. Oh, Shireen. great. Great to hear. Sorry, we just want another question related to you, the Security Economy Roadmap of MBSP. Does it include right. a, a plan for waste, hazardous waste uh, disposal? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the e-waste sector. Lah. It's e included, so included is, okay. in the e-waste sector. That's yeah. great. That's great. And uh, yeah, so I think we have one more question, just general, uh, I think oh, that's open to all, uh, maybe more to Zabri, Mrs. Zabri and uh, Catherine. It's uh, whether there's an adaptation plan for Penang on the, on climate, also, also, I mean, climate adaptation plan, you know, that deals with potentially, you know, severe floods, what's discussed here, urban heat island, and uh, would there be engagement with public and, and the civil society? Maybe Mr. Zabri, you can go. First. Okay, uh, I, I think Shinwe. Initially, uh, PGC also involved that we need to set up a disaster management unit in state level. So if that happen, we definitely will have a climate adaptation uh, policy or even a climate adaptation plan for Penang Island, uh, for the whole of Penang State. I'm sorry, All right? But I can say for Sabran Pry, okay, for Sabran Pry through our. Uh, flood mitigation uh, committee we definitely we have a plan but not to say a climate adaptation plan yet but a disaster uh, management plan so therefore for what we want uh, how for us to tackle disaster and how for us to mitigate uh, the cost of the disaster so maybe in future we should think about how for us to have a climate adaptation plan lah. okay now what i say earlier we have a climate action strategies Okay, so in that climate action strategies, actually, we have already a forecast for another 10 years what will happen to Sobran Prai. Okay, where are the vulnerable areas in Sobran Prai? So we have identified all these areas and all, all the uh, impact that will be faced by Sobran Prai. So from that document, I think people will, uh, our, our engineers, our architects, our developers, our builders, they can have a better understanding on how for them to have a better urban planning, a better development in Sabran Prai. So, if we need to have a climate adaptation plan, I think it's better for us to have a whole statewide uh, because it can also give us the opportunity to get certain amount of budgetary from the state. Yeah. Great. And uh, maybe Catherine and, and uh, Margie, how do businesses do adaptation? I mean, Catherine, you know, you has. Have you sort of uh, looked into uh, how to make your site, you know, physically resilient towards uh, any future climate uh, change impact? Uh, can you unmute? Sorry, Catherine. No, uh, we need the rotan. <laughs> Maybe uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I ask mean... Amaji. Amaji, what's the rotan? <laughs> <laughs> Amaji, can you unmute as well, please? Yeah, um, very quickly, adaptation. Uh, interestingly, in the uh, investor community internationally, uh, investors and banks are also asking companies at the moment to disclose uh, what is the financial impact from climate-related risks and opportunities in their uh, financial uh, reports, yeah, statements. So this is a very big push around the world by the TCFD. So what's happening is because of that, companies are now okay, have waking up again, thinking about you know, climate risk and what they have to do in terms of mitigation, adaptation and all that. Adaptation, I suppose, uh, especially in uh, industry related to agribusiness, agriculture, again, uh, my favorite, yeah, the oil palm sector has no choice but to look into adaptation because of weather patterns are changing. So one of the ways is are they looking at uh, uh, seedling seeds, yeah, better quality seeds that can uh, withhold different uh, kinds of temperature and all that. Uh, they also have to look at, you know, irrigation and all that. So uh, agribusiness is very sensitive to this. You can see that in our, uh, we had an article recently, the paddy farmers in uh, Kedah have actually I'm, I was very surprised they've actually mentioned climate change in the discussion with governments and they have come up and said that, look, we're having problems. So they need to think about uh, adaptation. 
But um, even uh, there are national plans on adaptation. Malaysia also has is part of uh, coming up with a national plan for adaptation. It's not as fast as mitigation, uh, but we are all thinking about adaptation as well. So it depends on uh, which industry. I mean, like tourism, the hotel industry, those that are at the coast, yeah, they need to understand that you know more and more erosion is going to happen. So even Catherine, I think uh, she's going to have to think about her spices, her plants, and all that in terms of weather patterns and all. The only problem with this is uh, this is a lot of projection work. You need to you need to do a lot of modeling. You need to understand scenario analysis. You know, like for Catherine now, she's an operator of, of a, a, a place. She needs data. She needs information. She needs to know, okay, uh, you are telling me temperature is going to increase. You are telling me sea level. Where is the data? Come on, guys, give us some data. You know, so she needs to know the next two years what's going to happen, next five years what's going to happen. Otherwise, she's not going to know what to do. So who is there to help her? Back to you. <laughs> no, so maybe my last comment on the last question. Uh, the, the question was actually asked by Calvin Dion from WRF. We, like uh, Mr. Abri said, the, the state government has actually uh, agreed to, setting, to set up this new so disaster management unit where there will be a big, por a, big, a big portion of its role is to do data and then planning. At the moment, we are very reactive. We are, you know, we, we're good at reacting to events, but there's no planning ahead capacity. So the new new unit will focus on the planning data collection as well as community outreach and capacity building. So, you know, stay tuned for more info. We just say, you know, it's just like slowly starting up and we will be definitely looking to work with MBSP and BPP on, on this. And in terms maybe of... Maybe uh, in five years time, eh? Shinui, eh? No, 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 it's going to happen soon, Mrs. Abi. It's going to happen soon. Just, but, just don't go anywhere. We need, we need you. But, but Shinwei, uh, climate adaptation is not disaster reduction. It's not only about disaster. We have to, it is about adaptation. The entire yeah, so, planning and all that. You know? Yeah, like, like you say, at the moment, we, a lot of data is missing, right? We don't know. Our, even our planning, our land use planning, doesn't, didn't really look at climate resilience. Right? We didn't even know what's going to hit us let alone planning. So we need to know first what's going to hit us. And, and the, we presented, I mean, in the first webinar, we presented a review paper that we are working on, just compiling information, not doing any primary research, just compiling information that, that's out there about what's going to hit Penang, right? Food security, water, flood, all this. And we presented it to the outline to the, the chief minister and he said, this is, gonna, this is a must read document to all for all departments, you know, to, to, to understand what we need to prepare, we need to know what's going to happen. So that's the first step. So that, that, that's going to be what, what we're going to do. And then- Shiri, uh, Shiri, can, can, yes. can I share something? Yes, yes, go ahead. That's, that's, that's the reason why I say Subramprat is the best city in Malaysia. Because what? Penang is just thinking about setting up a unit uh, for disaster management, but we already have a crisis management department and also a climate change unit to think, to get the data and also to, uh, to have some kind of advice for our builders and our uh, developers. That's why I said we need to work with you, right? Just don't go anywhere in the next five years. So we, we will definitely, this is a, a statewide effort. It's not going to be just one person in the state government doing all this. It's not, right? So we just need to create synergy with the local councils to get as comprehensive as data as possible so that we can give data to entrepreneurs like Catherine, right? If you need to plan for your adaptation, you will get the, the data at the moment. It's, it's pretty, whether it is you know, uh, scattered uh, or there's no information. And in terms of uh, adaptation, I think maybe Kelvin, you uh, we would really be happy to to work with WRF on this. So you, we have that opportunity, you know, setting up the new unit. We have also given input to uh, local plants that both MBS, uh, MBSP and, and MBPP are working on, you know, just to add in uh, a section on climate resilience. You know, how it's going to impact on infrastructure planning, where do we put our next water treatment plant, you know, all these. You need to take into account how our the, the brown pride and island are going to be affected. And we know that uh, Think City, which is an uh, uh, institution, you know, under Kazana, they are also working with MBPP on nature-based climate adaptation. So they have, they have this, this project going on where they look at uh, using a natural engineering so so turning like planting trees and turning uh, uh you know 
a canal canalize a river into back to the natural you know uh, river banks how do they use nature based adaptation to to help Penang island to be more resilient so maybe there's something that you know mbsp can can work with them before as well so there are things that are starting to move but we are of course we are we understand that there's a big gap that we need to fill but it's never too late to fill so the state government needs to work with local governments and to work with businesses need to work with communities and NGOs to make all this happen so the the, the wheel is there this the wheel is started to to roll but uh, we we'll get there one day it's not going to be five years mr zabi it's going to be soon we're going to keep calling you now is that really now that I know you are so keen? But that's that's uh, that's all the questions that we have. Is there anything the panelists you want to ask each other or highlight? You know, with each other, to, to each other. No, uh, I'll let. Uh, yeah, I just I just want to I want to congratulate you, the PGC, for the work that you have been doing. I'm very pleased that I managed to contribute a little bit. Uh, previously in this work. I have not seen any other state government doing the amount of work that the Penang government is doing. And uh, I mean, well done, guys. Thank you, Amarj. I mean, it wouldn't happen without all of you. So all of you had been uh, members of our working groups, right? So the reports are done. We just need to be we need them to be endorsed officially by the government. And then we will put online so everyone can access this 10 you know re reports uh, uh, under pga but the reports are just the first step or well, not even first 0 0.1 step right now we sort of know where we need to go then a lot of things need to come to you know together and and we need to know that we need to know that what you do on agriculture will affect on water and water need to work with agriculture same we you know is food security you need to work with tourism right if, if there's not a food security issue you're not going to have your tourism especially for penang we are famous for food. So all these different, piece, different pieces need to come together and this is what we are trying to do. So it will not, it would not have happened without all of you. That's why we always you know, say, oh, send you a heartfelt thank you. But uh, before we leave, uh, just some updates. So our next webinar, our fourth and penultimate webinar will be on disaster management. Uh, it will be on the 27th of August. Uh, two days before that, so that's on the Thursday, two days before that, uh, uh, another team of PGC will have a, a more sort of relaxed informal session called the Sandbank session, talking about waste management. And, and that's related to, to disaster as well. When, what what happened? How do we deal with our waste when a disaster happens? So stay tuned on that and please, please put uh, give attention to our, our website. And again, if you have any comments, any feedback, you know, how we should do better, or if you want Amatu to come back again for the next two sessions. <laughs> You can let us know, you know, vote for, you know, what went So <laughs> anyway, just give us your feedback. We will be really, really glad, uh, glad to hear from you. But